Not that we ever need to ask ourselves what we're fighting for, but it always helps to re be reminded. And oftentimes it's the stories of mothers and their children that just are among the most devastating. And when it goes right, some of the most uplifting. So I wanted to bring up here two remarkable ladies, Karen Garrison and Dorothy Gaines. Good evening, good evening. Thank God for another day because we're here to fight and have some victories. But in 1998 at 5.30 in the morning, I heard on my door, they took my babies out of there and charged them with cocaine conspiracy. The 14 people they didn't even know. No drugs, no guns. They tore my house up, which wasn't too hard, but they tore everything up looking for more drugs. They were kind enough to let me put my dog outside, 110 pit, um, Doberman that weighed in and wasn't playing with them, but they put him outside. I went to get my sons and I said, wait a minute now, what's going on? I got to know what's happening here, because I'm going to fight for my boys, I make that clear. But I got to know what's going on this time, I'm going to fight with you, but next time you're on your own. They say, no mommy, we didn't do this. Don't worry about it, it'll be okay. If we have to go to court, they're going to drop these charges. They know we're not crack dealers. My boys never missed a day in school, but in the third grade, when I bought them new mattresses, and he, Lawrence got some kind of allergy and he missed school. That's the only time. At Howard University, they never missed a day. They never stayed out all night. I had good men, good up and coming black educated lawyers, which I believe that was the threat. But DC wouldn't take them. Marilyn said on TV, I couldn't take the conspiracy. I had nothing on the Garrison twins. But the good old Commonwealth of Virginia said, bring your black boys here, I got them. My son's got 15 and a half and 19 and a half years. I had court-appointed lawyers that didn't care about them. They played like they didn't even know them. The marshals say, they're good friends. I said, they can't be. I just intro were introduced to them. They introduced themselves to each other. So they played a game, but don't forget the prosecutors. They already had it in the making. In trial, they had even a guy wrote me back and said, they put me up to the window and wanted me to identify them as drug dealers that sold me crack. I said, I can't do that to those boys. They're not even hustling boys. Don't make no difference. But with the sentencing reduction, I was able to fit in with some great organizations. Wherever they let me get in, I fit in, I worked hard till we got a reduction. Lawrence came home two years early. Lamont came home four years early. You know, and they're home now and they're doing good. And they got a smile on their face and I don't understand it. But I know I put down a hard, strong foundation with my boys. But don't you forget those prosecutors. I don't want you to ever forget. They like uh, guys with a new Corvette riding through town acting cute and doing what they want to do. That's what they did in this case. But don't forget that they're others. You have to treat them as your own. And I say all the time, no matter, black, white, I don't care. They're in trouble, you got to treat them as your own. And so then when Lawrence came home, we realized we were so prepared, but not really prepared. When they came home, we decided to do a radio show I learned about, something free we do. On my way home, Lawrence told them the 12 steps that the feds prepare you to get home. They tell you all these little things, and we weren't prepared, but Lawrence knew, Mommy, we got to tell somebody this. That's what started. I say, I got it now. When after he came home, his brother came home, well, he said he's taking a little rest now because his brother's home. And his brother said he won't get back on the radio till he does. So they've met up and they occasionally get on the show. But I got Mommy Activist and Son's radio show because for two reasons. My sons call me Mommy. And then for another reason, I was called activist. I didn't even know what that was. I had to go look it up and make sure they didn't call me something bad. <laughs> but I know that I have sons all over in the federal system that, de that begin to depend on me. And that's what I do. That's my niche. God walked me to that. To that, he gets me through it. And those are my steps that were ordered. And as we begin to continuously do the radio show, I always had Dorothy, and I was always in a corner from 2000 on. And I said, well, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do something to make sure she's OK and we're OK and we're going to do the right thing. So I started to think, well, maybe I'll make her a reunification specialist. Then when my friends in France and New Zealand and places started to ask me questions, you know, I said, well, I'm going to make her the international reunification specialist. <laughs> 
So now that we're here at DPA, I know that Dorothy is the international reunification specialist, but I'll let her explain why she's at this point, how she got to this point, and why we'll always be connected as we all are. Come on, Dorothy. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to stand here knowing that 20 years ago, DPA was fighting for me. Criminal justice policy was fighting for me. Families Against the Mandatory Minimum was fighting for me, along with my only son at nine years old was fighting for me. Yes, I am a reunification specialist. I take people from the time of indictment, families, to the courtroom, through the sentencing, after the sentencing, and when mothers that are in prison, their children die and they can't get there, I do my best to be there to fill in for them. Today is a hardship of what a mother felt and what mothers feel when their children are locked up. I'm reminded that I was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. In 1995, I was sentenced to 20 years. With the help of all the organization, I was able to get a, a clemency in 2000, two days before Christmas, by former President Bill Clinton. Today, today, as I stand before you, my only son turned 29 years old yesterday, and he is laying in a state prison facing a life sentence. Now I feel what my mother felt when she died six months after I got to prison, my mother died because she couldn't take the pain. Two years ago, I was laying on life support. They were looking for me to live overnight, and all they could find was that I was stressed from my child. Thank God for my grandson that has stood by me, and DPA, he's coming to help me out because this has been so hard on my health. But what I want you to know is I want you to pray and fight with me when the, when the prosecutor laid a life sentence on the table and told my son to plead out, he said, no. My son has an addiction that started at nine years old when he tried to kill himself when I went to prison. My 11-year-old daughter that was molested while I was in prison at 11 years old has an addiction at 30 years old because I was the only parent. Their father died when they was two and three years old with a massive heart attack. My son don't deserve life. My son deserves treatment and because of me leaving him. So as I stand before you, I'm wondering, and I said to my son, I'm sorry that I left you, but it wasn't on me. They locked me up because I refused to be a snitch and lie on someone. That's why I left my son. That's what my son looked like when I left him, and he was fighting for me. Now my son is in, federal, in prison. He leaving an eight-year-old girl that's crying every day for his day, her daddy. This is my son now, wearing white. And when I leave the prison, I think about when he left the prison, when I was in prison, crying, looking through the fits. Now when I leave from visiting him, I'm looking at my son and don't know. I don't want this to be my last DPA conference, but the way I'm feeling now, I will be dead if somebody don't help me bring my child home. Thank you for having me. And every Thursday, and every Thursday we have high power mainline calling, but I always mention Dorothy and her work. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Karen.